I'm today in Los Angeles with Martin Mo, the most famous artist. That is what he's known for. Mati, for example, painted three houses in pink. I want to talk to Mati about how he uses social media in order to sell his art and makes a revenue of more than... Enough, yeah, plenty. Mati, thank you very much for taking the time. Thank you, Magnus. To, uh, to talk to me. Um, what's your background? How did you get into all of this? Sure. Um, I was involved in building advertising technology for platforms like Facebook and Google after graduating Stanford in 2008 from my undergraduate degree. Um, after about seven years of that profession, I transitioned into art. Um, the focus of my advertising technology background was helping direct-to-consumer businesses, which was a new thing at the time, use ads and targeting to sell products to the public. Um, and as I started to think about the types of products that sold well to the public, um, I realized that certain traits and characteristics of those products um, were, were very much represented in art as a product. And so I made the transition from being a service to other brands to building my own brand, which happened to be an art brand. And uh, I lucked into the name The Most Famous Artist. There was a certain moment when you decided to become an artist, right? Sure, it was when I wanted to do whatever I wanted to do. <laughs> But I'm talking well, about, yeah, I'm talking we'll about leave it at that. I mean, there's, yeah, there's plenty of there was plenty of moments which have um, informed my art practice. But I would say that um, the more I get into art, the more I realize that every moment informs your art practice. All right. Yeah. <laughs> I want to talk about. There's a story that you were driving down the autobahn in Germany, and then your car crashed and, and it yes, flipped it's, a couple it's of times. spun around yeah. twice, flipped over because our rear tire popped. And as I was facing death, I realized that my life had no consequence. Um, and that, that didn't so much have to do with my contributions, but my own perspective of the importance of my work. Um, and through art, I've been able to find um, intense gratification And so you would say being an artist makes you more happy than your previous life. You had uh, very successful internet companies, social media uh, agencies, and so on. One was about to be sold. You could have been a, a very rich person. I right already now. was a very rich person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think um, the reason I think art is a fantastic career is because art is about um, living life and taking action with intention. And then being able to archive those intentional gestures over a period of time to create a narrative that becomes the story of your life. And um, it wasn't until I became an artist that I started to live life a bit more mindfully. It wasn't just the pursuit of more wealth and, and more power. It was quite literally um, thinking about the minutia of my day-to-day -day activities and how they, um, how they sum up into something more consequential. Let's talk about your art a little bit. Can you name a couple of art projects that you're working on or that you worked on in the past? Sure. Um, I think it's important to understand that I have two main art practices, um, three main art practices, we'll say. Uh, one is uh, a reaction to social media, which is that I recognize that there are people out there who want to take pictures of themselves for their social media identities. And as an artist, I try to create backdrops for those pictures to be taken. And as a byproduct of creating those backdrops, I get distribution for my artwork and I get more followers as a result of it. So I'll call that practice my selfie-friendly murals. Um, I also create headline-worthy projects, which means that I know that the news media is looking for stories to publish into news feeds to generate clicks back to their websites, to generate advertising revenue, which keeps their media machine going. So as an artist, I try to think of projects that generate headlines to then feed to news media outlets to get me additional distribution on my art and my brand. And finally, I monetize uh, both of those practices with um, selling of artworks direct to consumer that are most of the time found objects at flea markets that I paint contemporaneous themes on top of, um, primarily because it's a very diverse practice and I have a lot of breadth available to me as a result of that, um, but also because the unit economics really work. 
Let's give an example for the first category that you mentioned, sure. the selfie practice. Sure, so th the most obvious version of a selfie-friendly wall is I created a mural in 2015 that just said selfie, repeated over and over again on a black wall with a bunch of colors close to the beach in Venice, California. Um, that mural was photographed by many thousands of people, and then Los Angeles Magazine said it was the most Instagrammable mural in Los Angeles. That gave me the credibility to then go to other building owners and say, hey, I'm good at making walls that people want to come take photos in front of, which then opened up a whole bunch more walls for me to then paint. And it created this, um, this flywheel through which I got to distribute my art through murals. Um, when we talk about- Another project would be the pink houses? The headline worthy projects. Oh, okay. That's, That's kind category. of more of a headline worthy project because that is, that is something that was like so shocking. And I kind, of, I kind of said, okay, so there's these houses that are about to be demolished. What could I do to them that would generate press? I noticed that there's a really popular wall in Los Angeles called the Paul Smith wall, which is bright pink. So I appropriated that and painted this entire block of houses pink. Um, it upset the neighbors. It started a discussion about uh, gentrification in, in urban environments. Um, and it also started a conversation about the role of public art in gentrification. And as a result of all of those, those different conversations, the news media wrote about it, including the New York Times, Time Magazine, amongst others. Um, and then my flea market works are quite literally a reaction to what's going on on the internet. So for example, when Mauricio Catalan uh, put the banana on the wall at Art Basel uh, in Miami at the end of 2019, I, I had my studio paint a banana on top of a canvas that was bought from a flea market for $20 and I, I sold it for close to 2,000 US dollars because my brand is strong as a result of the headline worthy projects and the murals, um, but because it was also relevant to a particular audience because it was, um, in, it was in the collective consciousness at the time. Let's talk about how you make money. So when we, when we look at the Instagrammable works, you just create those backgrounds and then you don't really get much money from this. In but some cases, so there's, there's, there's two ways that goes. Sometimes I get hired by brands to paint murals for them, which is much like painting an out of home billboard or an, an advertisement. Yeah. Um, the challenge with that type of work is that after you're done painting a mural for a brand, you've got to find your next mural for your brand to keep your revenue stream going. What I've also noticed is that if I pay for the painting of a wall, which could be sub a few thousand dollars, um, then I have the right to license that wall to brands. So in the event, in the case of my polka dot wall in downtown Los Angeles, I was able to license that wall to a number of brands uh, from I probably shouldn't name too many names, but quite, quite big brands for many thousands of dollars over and over and over again because it became a cultural destination. Enough people took a photo in front of that wall that the brand decided that they wanted to inject themselves into that conversation. So and so that? they had to pay me to do a photo shoot in front of it. Oh, wow. So that's, that's one monetization yeah. mechanism. Um, and then the second is I buy artworks from flea markets and then paint on top of them and then sell them directly to my audience. Only via Instagram? Only via Instagram up until recently. Now I'm starting to work with a distributed network of galleries because I've earned enough credibility and have a great enough um, story to entice galleries to work with me wherein they don't actually hold physical inventory. They have inventory sheets. They then sell that inventory to their customers. And then I drop ship the art to that gallery. Okay. Let's talk about the art market in a second. I want to focus a little bit more on your Instagram audience that you sell artworks to. I know a lot of artists who have a huge audience on Instagram, but they don't really sell to them. What are the price points that you need to have that you, that this audience buys? Sure. I think for an original artwork, you can sell direct on Instagram for somewhere between like 750 and 1750 US dollars. Um, that's the sweet spot for me. How big is that piece then? This side? Typic, no, that's, that's quite big. So, so this gets to a good point, which is like the question that I get asked a lot by artists is how do you price your art? 
And when I got thinking about it, well, it's really the a number of hours that you put into it multiplied by the value you put on your per hour labor um, plus the cost of your materials plus the cost of shipping. And if you can sell your artworks at exactly that formula, you get to focus on continuing your practice because you're getting paid a healthy hourly wage, you're covering all of your costs and you're getting your work out into the marketplace. I think that the challenge right now as we move from um, working with galleries exclusively to working directly with our own customers as artists is how to price our art because galleries have to inflate your prices for a couple of reasons. They have to inflate it because they have a retail space to pay for, but also because they have a certain type of clientele that's used to paying a certain type of price. And your art may be too early for that price point, which precludes you from selling to that gallery. What I recommend that artists do is think about what you want your hourly wage to be, measure the amount of time you put into a particular painting or, or artwork, um, keep a rigorous, uh, catalog or a rigorous note of how much it costs you to make that work. Estimate your shipping costs and try to keep your artwork small so your shipping costs don't get uh, super inflated. And then come up with a price that's fair and be able to articulate it directly to your customers why your art is this price. In your post, when you sell, when you created a new work, you do a post and then you write the price in the description? In some cases, I write the price in the description. My My strategy is keeps evolving. I think that's the, the nature of the internet is that what works today isn't going to work tomorrow. Yeah. So it requires just kind of like constant iteration. And there's many times where I've created artworks and they haven't sold for months and it's been largely seasonal or perhaps it's that my art isn't any good or it's that I've fallen out of favor. Um, but it didn't stop me from innovating until I figured out what was working. And I think there's a couple things that work particularly well on the internet that aren't going away anytime soon, like social proofing. If a, a celebrity or a, a, a collector has your work, they are social proof that then helps your audience believe that your work is worth collecting. Um, showing receipts of your work being sold in real time, that helps drive demand. Um, creating so showing that there's the demand there's demand showing art showing scarcity like okay so we've got five works oh now it's 20 minutes in there's four works left and you start to create this scarcity you do stories stories absolutely you want to kind of create an experience out of selling your work online you can't just post it and then hope it sells i post it and then i go into my collector rolodex and i start sending dms to all the people who have expressed interest in my work or have bought works um, either within that particular series or have ex or are just avid supporters of my business. I think one thing that artists might underestimate is that once, an, once a person has bought work from you, they're invested. And so long as, they're, as you're demonstrating progress and you're, you're continuing to provide for that person who's buying your work the inspiration or the entertainment that they're looking for, they're going to be willing to continue to support you. Who are you a buyer? Uh, I, uh, I have a number of buyer archetypes, as I'll call them. Um, because I came from the tech world and I made a lot of people a lot of money in the tech world, a lot of my collectors are people who know me through the tech world. Um, my buyers are also interior de decorators who are looking for affordable works that have a cool story to then place into homes they're decorating. Um, my buyers are people who follow celebrities who I've either gifted work or sold work to. Um, my buyers are, my buyers are people who discover me through my selfie friendly murals or discover me through my headline worthy projects. It's a number of different, uh, different types of buyers. And, and each buyer has a different price point that they're willing to purchase at and they have different um, needs in terms of what they're looking for. Let's talk about the art market a little bit. So far, what you just mentioned, you could do completely exclusive and you don't need the art market for this. But you mentioned before that you like to partner now with galleries. Why do you want to become part of the art world? Sure. So I don't know that I, the, the, art, the art world, as, as you've uh, said it, is, a, is not as narrow as perhaps um, 
the antagonistic view that we might have of the art world uh, suggests. Like, there is, um, there is the art world that decorates homes, and there is the art world that sells stuff to Ikea to then distribute broadly, and there is the art world that is at the art fairs, and there is the art world that is the group galleries on Melrose Avenue, and there is the art world that is just people on Instagram looking for artworks. I think the essence is that as long as people have disposable income, which I think increases as technology and life gets better for the entire population of the world, um, there will be walls to decorate and art will need to be purchased. And so that happens along a broad spectrum from, from Ikea posters or t-shirts with a Basquiat print on it all the way up to million dollar artworks. And what's your goal? My, gr my goal is to participate along all aspects of that spectrum. I happen to come into the market in the, the low direct to consumer um, category and I haven't gone downstream yet and sold t-shirts and merchandise of my work and I also haven't gone upstream but I've built a strong enough base in the middle where I'm not feeling I'm not feeling uh, disenfranchised by not being included in the art market because I might just not be ready yet. My work, my work um, might not be well positioned for high end buyers, but with enough practice and, and, and enough time, I could be a great artist within the art world, as you describe it. What does it require in order to make it in the art world? Um, well, if you look at an artist like Cause, it requires massive consumer adoption before the art world participates. But if you look at an artist like Jeff Koons, it requires significantly wealthy collectors to prepay for your work such that you can finance the production of really extravagant objects that uh, already have places in institutions and museums. And which route are you taking? I'm doing it all because I don't think that um, there's this antiquated notion of what an artist is. An artist is either one or the other. And if you're other, you're, you can't be this, this thing that um, exists in the upper echelons of the art market. I don't necessarily believe that. I believe that the internet has created incredibly democratic, uh, an incredibly democratic system or architecture through which you can be whatever you want to be. You just got to go fucking do it. And so I guess I'm taking a longer view. Like I'm not disappointed that I'm not on the level of Damien Hirst yet. Do I believe deep down I can get there? Yes. Do you think your art is as good as his? Good is subjective. <laughs> That's what I'm always saying. <laughs> good is subjective, man. And so right there are certain people who think his art is good. There are others that think it's, his art is garbage. Um, I think his art is clever. And at the end of the day, when you look at Damien Hirst's Instagram, it looks like the dude's having fun. I don't, I, I will in no way go to uh, start practicing art where it becomes unfun. Because that's what I'm here to do. I'm here to participate in a lifestyle that allows me uh, the time and space to think about the world around me and to reflect that through my practice. But what you say is that there, it's hard to get into this gallery system and become relevant there. And it takes time. It takes time. And so you have to figure out how to become self-sustaining so that you buy yourself the time to experiment enough to get there. Otherwise, you go to art school, you graduate, and you either make it or you don't. But if you go to art school, you graduate, you adopt um, pricing strategy, marketing strategy, and a lifestyle that gives you the time and space to develop your practice, these incremental uh, improvements compound over time and you eventually become what you think you can be. Can you name three advice that you like to share with artists? Sure. Um, be rational in that you are operating a business and you have to participate in the market in order to sustain yourself, to get the time and space to practice your work. Um, being an artist is incredibly lonely and 
cultivating a community of people who want to see you succeed and that you can help succeed is a way to uh, protect yourself from that loneliness and, and the potential downfall that that could, that, could, that could come as a result of that. And go with your gut. The internet has a lot of people who have no face telling you what they think about what you're doing. And if you succumb to the internet's uh, feedback, then you lose the, the essence of your creativity, which is just the source channeling creativity through you. Instead of, instead of reacting to what people think of your creativity, just keep doing it. Those are my three pieces of advice. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Why do you look at me like this? What do you mean? I don't know. It makes me nervous when you look at me like this. Yeah, that's your problem. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's the most famous artist. Just what did I say? The, the world's most known artist. Uh, the, 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 the most famous, famous artist, uh, uh, period.